Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 213 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. In 1621, the Pilgrims of Plymouth Colony and their Wampanoag neighbors came together to celebrate their first harvest. Today, we remember this event is the first Thanksgiving. But what do we really know about this holiday and the people who celebrated it? So much of what we know about the pilgrims in the first Thanksgiving comes to us through myth and legend, which is exactly why we need to pull back the curtain on this famous American celebration and explore what it is that historians know about this event and the people who celebrated it. To help us suss out fact from fiction is Rebecca Frazier, a writer and biographer whose latest book, is a history of the pilgrims who founded Plymouth Colony. It's called The Mayflower, The Families, The Voyage, and The Founding of America. Now, as we investigate the lives and experiences of the pilgrims, Rebecca reveals details about the group we know as the pilgrims and why they chose to migrate to North America, how the pilgrims experienced their transatlantic crossing aboard the Mayflower, and information about how the pilgrims established Plymouth Colony and celebrated the so-called First Thanksgiving. But first. Hello, Seattle. I'm headed your way on Saturday, December 1st, and I'm going to host a meetup. We'll gather at the Alaskan Sourdough Restaurant and Bakery on the Alaskan Way at 3 p.m. It looks like a really good, chill place to hang out and have some chowder in a sourdough bread bowl. So Tim and I will plan to hang out there until about 4.30. And then we're going to walk across the street to the Copperworks Distilling Company for their 5 p.m. distillery tour. Now, you're more than welcome to join us on that tour, too. Or perhaps you just want to come and take the tour with us. Either way is great, but you do have to buy tickets for that tour in advance. I've included links to both the bakery and the distillery tour in the show notes. Or you can click open your Ben Franklin's World app, which is free and available in all your favorite app stores. You can click open the Ben Franklin's World app and see those links listed right there for you to click right now. So again, we're meeting up in Seattle on Saturday, December 1st at 3 p.m. at the Alaskan Sourdough Bakery and Restaurant on the Alaskan Way. And then if you want, you can join Tim and I for a tour of the Copperworks Distillery. Just be sure you buy your tickets for that tour in advance. All right, are you ready to meet the pilgrims of Plymouth Colony? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a writer, broadcaster, and former president of the Bronte Society. She's the author of three books, including a biography of Charlotte Bronte. The People's History of Britain, and her most recent work, The Mayflower, The Families, The Voyage, and The Founding of America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Rebecca Frazier. Thank you. Great to be here. Rebecca, your visit with us is so timely because this is the week that we celebrate the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. So I know we have lots of questions about Plymouth Colony, the Pilgrims, and of course, about the Mayflower. Now, for some of us, our education about early American history starts with how the Pilgrims established Plymouth Colony in 1620, and then went on to enjoy that first Thanksgiving with local Wampanoag people in 1621. But we also know a lot of what we learn about this story is based on historical memory and not historical fact. So I wonder if we could start our exploration of this story with the Pilgrims. Would you tell us about the Pilgrims and who these early European settlers in Massachusetts were? Well, in this instance at Plymouth, they were 101 people on the Mayflower and then the crew are extra, men and women, mainly in their 20s and 30s, who are mostly members of an illegal separatist church, which began in England, but now also included members of illegal churches from the southern coast of England, as well as the north, and also some French and Flemish Protestants living in Leiden who had to settle in America because no one else would have them. And they all met at a minister called John Robinson's house in Leiden, and some lived in huts in his garden. There was a huge housing crisis in Holland because of the war between Holland and Spain, its overlord, and Protestants were pouring into the new Protestant Republic, fleeing the Spanish. So there was a huge refugee crisis, rather like today. And Robinson's large house was called the Green Gate, 
on the clock steeg and it had a huge garden. And John Robinson's brother-in-law was John Carver, who's probably one of the most famous pilgrims, the first governor of Plymouth Colony. And most of these people, particularly the ones from England, had started as farmers, but then worked in the wool industry in the Netherlands when they had to get out of England because you couldn't be a member of a separatist church there, but you could in Holland because the Netherlands tolerated all sorts of churches. And by 1617, it was clear that the Netherlands, who needed England's support in their war against Spain, was going to stop any separatist churches living in their country in return for English help. Plus, the war against Spain was about to resume. So they had to get out. And their sort of religious beliefs meant that they wouldn't go to England. And America was the answer. And this church, which had as I say, started really in southern Yorkshire, but now it was quite international, believed they had a covenant like the Jewish people. And the comparison was the working of God's will to save the chosen people in the Old Testament. And also on the Mayflower too, were people who were in more practical trades. So the really famous pilgrim, John Alden was there, but he starts out really as a barrel maker or cooper, as it was then called. And all these people were an advanced party of the fittest of the church community who were going to leave Holland and go to America and prepare the way for the less able-bodied. And I'll just say one more thing, which is that nowadays scholars have come to the conclusion that all these practical people who came on board at Southampton probably may have had sort of separatist sympathies, and that's why they were there. So in the past, they were regarded as the sort of practical people. Maybe they also were members of separatist churches. Wow. The Mayflower Pilgrims sound like a really diverse group of people. And when we normally hear about these pilgrims, we really hear about them as a group who came from England to find religious freedom. And yet it sounds like the pilgrims weren't just a group of people from England. No, the thing was that Leiden was this very international town because it was prepared to celebrate everything Protestant as a reward for its role in the revolt of the Netherlands against the Spanish. William the Silent had established the first Protestant university there, and they wanted Protestants. They wanted to have people printing Protestant tracts, and they didn't mind if they were illegal in England, which the stuff that William Brewster was printing, and that was shipped across to England from Holland, and people turned a blind eye to it. But Holland was this terrific Protestant center and a sort of place for freedom of Protestant speech. Could you tell us a bit more about what the pilgrims' lives were like while they were living in the Dutch Republic? I think they were absolutely awful. And William Bradford, the historian of the colony, he says that their children were withering in the bud. Children were forced to work, and they did work also in England. But the Dutch taskmasters were able to be much harsher on these people because they were foreigners. You know, they needed a job so that they would do anything. And so, They were all working very long hours and they were working in terrible conditions, very, very damp, small homes. There's a famous pilgrim museum run by one of the great experts on the pilgrim, Jeremy Bangs in Leiden. And you can go there and see the sort of place they lived in. And it was sort of 10 foot by 13 foot that everyone lived in that room. And it would probably have a family of six or seven, if not more. And they slept, ate, cooked there. And they were the lucky ones. So By and large, people were living in really dreadful conditions. And one of the reasons they were all in these huts in the garden of John Robinson was at least that was a good big space, but they were just wooden huts. So it was like a lot of this was accommodation flung up for poor people who nobody cared about. So it was very similar to refugees today. Now, as you mentioned, many of the pilgrims had belonged to the Scroby Congregation in Yorkshire, England before they migrated to Leiden in 1607, 1608 to worship as they wanted to worship. Did the fact that the Scroby congregation could worship in peace in Leiden help make up for the fact that their living conditions were not good? Yes. I mean, Edward Winslow, as well as William Bradford, is a great sort of historian of them and recalling what it was like to be in Leiden, said that he remembers they were all so happy together. And I think that the relief of getting out of England for a start and sort of being able to worship as they please. And these were very, very, you know, their religion, they were sort of passionately interested in trying to imitate Christ's earliest church. They felt like a family together. And I don't mean in a cult way. I meant that there was a warm feeling amongst them. And in fact, John Robinson and John Carver were both married into this family of sisters, the White Sisters. And I think there was almost a family compound 
so there was sort of great warmth amongst them, but they were also getting very fed up of Dutch ways. They didn't really approve of the Dutch churches and they were homesick for England. I mean, the English people were, they couldn't go back. And also the truce was coming to an end. So they had to go somewhere new. And America was pretty exciting. We've been discussing how the pilgrims moved to the Netherlands because they were religious separatists. Do we know how their faith differed from Anglicanism, which was the dominant faith in 17th century England? Basically, separatists create a little separate church, which is separate from the Church of England. And John Robinson was always very anxious that the Scrooby Church should not be described as a separatist church, although it was, because this was very upsetting to people, the idea of being separatists separated from their sort of beloved mother church. And in fact, when the Massachusetts colonists arrive in New England, the people in Plymouth are very worried that they're going to be looked down on and no one will talk to them because they are a separatist church, because it was a dirty word. And in fact, really what happens is that once the Anglicans get to New England, they are known to historians as non-separating congregationalists. But that's a sort of contradiction in terms, because what happens is they drop the prayer book, which was one of the conditions of the Church of England, which separatists didn't like because it was too middle of the road. So in fact, they are pretty separate once they get to New England. But basically, people who arrive in Massachusetts are all members of the Anglican Church, and the people who go to Plymouth are all separatists. But then there's a lot of sort of, you know, they're 3,000 miles from England, from the Archbishop of Canterbury. So new churches develop, the New England way develops. But basically, separatists, they weren't going to try and reform the Church of England from within. And they just decided it was unreformable. And so they decided they must create their own separate churches. But as I said, it was a matter of pain for John Robinson and in later life, he wanted to say this wasn't a separate church. It was a branch of the Church of England. You raised a really interesting point between pilgrims and Puritans. Many people confuse the pilgrims with Puritans, and the Puritans were those who settled in Boston 10 years after the pilgrims settled in Plymouth. Both groups migrated to what is now Massachusetts for religious reasons. So we have to wonder, what were the differences between the pilgrims, the group that we're talking about in this episode, who settled in Plymouth in 1620? and the Puritans who settled in and around Boston in 1630. Yes, the pilgrims who settle in Plymouth, the expedition is led by a separatist church from Scrooby, which then becomes the church in Leiden. It's separatist. It has its own way of doing things. It doesn't have a minister because John Robinson wasn't allowed to get on the Mayflower because investors were worried about his sort of radical nature. But the people who come to Boston come 10 years later they are also Puritans, but they are not separatists, but they've given up. They are worried that the Church of England under Charles I and the man who becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury, Bishop Lord, that Roman Catholicism is really taking over the Church of England. But they are all members of the Church of England. And then they create their own churches and people become members of those churches. And in fact, as you will know, you didn't have civil rights in Massachusetts unless you were a member of a church. Whereas interestingly, in Plymouth, it wasn't one of the prerequisites. You didn't have to be a member of the church to have the vote. It's really not sort of 40 or 50 years that that becomes so. So they were really more liberal in Plymouth, I would say. We've now discussed the pilgrims' lives in Leiden, how they lived and how they worshipped. What made them decide that it was time to leave the Dutch Republic and go to North America? Was it really the end of the 12 years truce? As I said, their conditions are pretty unpleasant. There was also a very patriotic feeling in England from the sort of mid 16th century carrying on about making Protestant colonies abroad. So there was a lot of sympathy in government circles for making a Protestant colony abroad, even if it was a separatist. But this was rather disguised that they were separatists. So when they were trying to get out of England, when they were trying to get a patent from the government, their leaders said that they would sort of cause the king was the head of their church, and so on and so forth. And it was really disguised how radical they were, because there was a feeling amongst Puritans, and that was a lot of the sort of the political nation of England at that time were Puritans, that there needed to be a fight back against the Pope 
who was regarded as the Antichrist and also the Spanish Empire. And if you could get a Protestant colony out there, you could look the other way at some of its practices, but at least it would be fighting the good fight. And of course, the Thirty Years' War begins around the time the pilgrims are negotiating. So it's all the more urgent to start building a Protestant empire in America. So all of these things mean that, one, there's a sort of patriotic urge amongst the Scrooby Church to create a Protestant colony. Two, there's a lot of sympathy at court and in the Virginia Company for them. And three, the truce between Holland and Spain is coming to an end in 1620. And it's quite possible that Spain would overrun Holland and then they would all be killed. So they had to get out. There was a sort of window for them to get out of Holland. They weren't going to be able to stay. Plus, James I had said, if you carry on allowing these illegal separatist churches in Holland, I'm not going to aid you against the Spanish. So the Dutch had also said they'd got to go. Now, once the pilgrims decided to leave the Netherlands, they boarded the ship Speedwell in late July 1620 and journeyed to England, where some of them would board the Mayflower. Both ships left for North America on August 5th. But not long after their departure, the Speedwell started taking on water, which meant that all the Speedwell's passengers had to crowd onto the Mayflower. Rebecca, Raymond would like to know what this crowded transatlantic voyage on the Mayflower was like. Specifically, he'd really like to know how the actual voyage compared with the Pilgrims' expectations for what their voyage would be like. Well, I think the answer is, I mean, none of them, other than a couple of the crew, had any experience of crossing the ocean. There was just one man who did, and that was Stephen Hopkins. And he had been on a ship which had been shipwrecked on Bermuda, which sort of creates the plot for the Tempest, Shakespeare's Tempest. And he'd gone on to live in Jamestown and then come back again. And he was a leather merchant. And so he had expectations of the transatlantic, but no one else had. So no one really knew what they were in for, except they knew that there was not much room on this ship, which was really very small. It was bigger than the Susan Constant and the other ships that came to Jamestown, which were about 120 tons. But it was 180, which was really quite little. It was 100 foot long and about 30 foot wide. And it had this very unwieldy stern, which was about 30 foot high. So in fact, it was not an ocean going vessel. So I don't think anyone knew what they were in for. I think they were very excited about going to the new world and getting away. But I think they were very naive. In fact, Edward Winslow wrote a letter back about a year later saying, don't expect North America to be full of inns and fairs where you can buy things. It's beautiful, but there is nothing there. You have to bring everything yourself. And they weren't really aware of how little was there, that they were going to a wilderness, however beautiful. Which does beg the question, what exactly did the pilgrims take with them to settle this new beautiful wilderness? They took clothing, they took bedding, they took guns, but not enough. They took armor, but that got tangled up in the briars and undergrowth. They took goats, but there really wasn't room for big draft animals. So their cattle don't arrive for another three years. And because they've had to get out of England very suddenly because the government turns against them, it's all very, very hurried. So they bought butter and they bought alcohol, aquavit, which they bought or made in Holland. And they bought a huge iron jack. And people used to think this was part of the Brewster printing press where he printed his illegal Puritan pamphlets in Holland. But people now think this was part of a frame raising so that rather like in Witness, that film about the Amish, there's a great scene when they sort of raise this huge frame, the whole community. That's what they did. They had houses, they had frame built houses. So they had this big iron thing, which was going to help to raise the frames, but they were obviously going to have to cut down wood. So they needed axes. They didn't have ovens. They didn't obviously have glass for the windows. They bought oil cloth. They bought meal in a barrel. And Edward Winslow, a year later again, says, let the sailors tell you how to pack things because everything on the Mayflower got very damp. And obviously the sailors were the great experts about what was needed. So the pilgrims brought clothing, armor, firearms, a big jack to raise barns and houses, axes to cut the wood that they would need to build those barns and houses, 
And I have to imagine that they brought at least some household goods, too, to outfit their houses. And all of this seems like a lot of cargo combined with 121 people for this 180 ton Mayflower. So how did they all fit together on the ship? Well, they were all cramped into this really very tiny space just above the hold, which measured 80 by 20, we think. And a lot of stuff had to be left behind. So that if you go into a museum and see this table came on the Mayflower, it almost certainly didn't because there just wasn't room. There probably almost wasn't room for spindles to spin cloth. It was okay taking clothing and linen bedding, but things like actual beds and chairs must have come across later. William Brewster had this huge library, 400 books, and whether they may have been on the Mayflower, maybe they were sufficiently compact that they could sort of be squashed in. But the thing was that two thirds of the church was still back in Leiden. So it was hoped they would come over in other ships and bring other material. But they did manage to bring small, nice things to remind them of home, their families, the white sport, a little writing chest with mother of pearl, sort of japanned, very, very elegant. And they bought mugs, they bought beer mugs, they bought hats, but they were going to have to make everything when they got there. So the pilgrims really just had the basic supplies that they would need to make a start in North America, plus their goats. How long were they all crammed aboard the Mayflower? I mean, how long did it take the pilgrims to reach Cape Cod and Plymouth? And did they enjoy good weather along the way? Well, it started off as a great voyage. It was sort of sunny and lovely for about 1,500 miles. And they prayed on deck. They sang psalms. The sailors were all pretty irreligious and nasty to them, but all was fine. And then mid-ocean, they hit this terrible storm, waves sort of 100 foot high, and it was all terrifying. And John Howland was swept overboard and brought back by a fishing hook. And it became extremely frightening. And then the main mast collapsed. There were three masts. And they used this sort of iron jack, this thing that they were going to raise houses with to prop up the mast. But there was a moment when the sailors were saying, we want to go back to England. You know, if the mast actually goes over, that's it. But anyway, they did manage to fix the mast and then they go on. And I think it was all pretty frightening. And at the same time, there was a baby. Stephen Hopkins, his wife had a baby and he was named Oceanus because of the ocean they were on. Now, on November 11, 1620, the Mayflower arrived at what is now Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is located right on the tip of Cape Cod. But as it happened, the pilgrims weren't aiming to land in Cape Cod or in Massachusetts. Rebecca, would you tell us where the pilgrims had hoped to settle and how they ended up in Massachusetts? Basically, we think they were aiming for Virginia and they had sort of some kind of patent in the name, not of any of them, in the name of a grand gentleman. And they were heading for Virginia, we think. And it's possible, however, they were really heading for New England because then they will be outside the jurisdiction of Virginia, which was not Puritan. It's thought they were sort of going down and then the sort of shoals and reefs near Martha's Vineyard made them panic and decide to go back up the coast. And by now, because they'd sort of set off twice, the weather was really quite bad. So they just sort of go up and they land on the top of the crab claw at Provincetown just to sort of put in. But it's obviously not a good place to settle because they need running water. It's too exposed. It's very sandy. They've got to have fields in which they're going to plant crops. But it was landfall at least. And it was a huge relief. And everyone sort of got off the ship and William Bradford said the ladies needed to wash. And obviously, they were probably forced to wash everyone's clothes as well. But at least they'd made land. And what was very exciting was that a lot of the trees were trees which looked rather the same as trees in England, except they were bigger and they were safe. You know, they'd arrived, but they realized they couldn't stay there. It was too exposed. So then they start to explore and Stephen Hopkins, again, is to the fore because we think he had some Indian words. I mean, other people had Indian words because there were lots of vocabularies of Indian words, of um, Wampanoag or Algonquian words published at the time. 
But anyway, Stephen Hopkins was on these expeditions, as was Edward Winslow, as was William Bradford. And of course, Mars Stanford, who was the military leader who'd been a soldier in the Netherlands. So they're out sort of excitedly looking for Native Americans. And then, in fact, William Bradford's foot is caught in a deer trap and he's very impressed by how clever it is. But anyway, they go on and they're drinking Akovit. And eventually, they are attacked by what turn out to be the Nauset tribe. But nothing terrible happens. Arrows are fired at them and the pilgrims far back, or they sort of brandish a log. And then they decide that the weather is really getting very bad. This is coming to be late November, and they've really now got to find somewhere they're going to settle before the real storms of December set in, when the sea will just be unsailable. So they go around in a shallop, and they cross Cape Cod Bay, and eventually one of the crew remembers that there was a sort of pleasant place, which turns out to be Plymouth Bay, and then they settle there, or rather they land there. And then the sort of house building begins. On, In fact, on Christmas Day, they start building a common house and they build a platform for their cannon because they have no idea where they are. I mean, the place is full of cornfields. It's rather strange. And the more they walk around, they realize that they're seeing skulls. And it turns out that this was known to Wampanoags as Patuxet. It was a Wampanoag settlement, but they were hit by this terrible plague, the smallpox. And so the people died probably a couple of years before, but their cornfields are still there. In fact, so badly prepared are the pilgrims because of the rush of getting out of Holland and getting out of England. They don't have grain. So they have to borrow grain from a Native American grave and they feel very bad about this and they put it back, but they need something to plant. One of the other things they've got to do is settle in order to have a harvest the next year. And already there's a big problem having left so late that the ground is frozen. So they have to dig it up with their swords. It's so hard. And of course, everybody is getting terribly ill. You know, the weather is closing in. There's an epidemic on the ship. All their clothes are soaking wet. And it's beginning to be the epidemic, which is going to wipe out 50% of the pilgrims by early March. So although it's very exciting, they've found a place which has lovely sweet water brooks it is also pretty scary and depressing. You know, at one point, there's only five people who are not sick who are able to tend to the sick. And one of the problems, they don't really have much time to plant because they are so busy burying people. And they also have to bury them at night so that Native Americans do not realize how few their dwindling numbers. So it's a very, very tense time. It's really amazing that none of them sort of said, we want to go home. But meanwhile, the sailors are being very disagreeable and saying that, you know, they weren't meant to be staying here. But of course, the only place of shelter is the Mayflower because they haven't had time to build. They haven't had time to cut down the trees and make wattle and daub. You know, they need the Mayflower to remain in situ while they create buildings for themselves to live in. In fact, when they were in Provincetown, the wife of William Bradford, Dorothy Bradford, fell overboard. And it's a matter of huge conjecture why she fell overboard. Some people think it may have been suicide, and this is fiercely resisted by others. But maybe she just found, you know, getting to the New World in late November a very scary prospect. But this obviously cast a blight, as did the ongoing deaths of everybody. And a lot of the people who did die were young men who were meant to sort of come out to cut down the trees. And, you know, they were sort of muscly. So it was all pretty awful, really. So what's the timeline that we're looking at here? The pilgrims arrive in Provincetown on November 11, 1620. And by what time are they in Plymouth trying to plant their fields and stave off an epidemic? I think that they arrive on December the 7th. So they've had a couple of weeks sitting around at Provincetown and then sort of exploring up the coast to see where to go next. And then I think by December the 15th, they are anchored at Plymouth. So they've had, you know, quite a few weeks at Provincetown. And when did winter set in and really start to limit them just to the Mayflower? It starts in Provincetown in that William Bradford describes the water being frozen or the water freezing on their clothes when they're sort of wading across to get to the land. That's sort of pretty soon after they arrive. 
and it's becoming very stormy and they're really sort of blown onto Plymouth Bay. But it certainly is going to get a lot worse after that. But by December, they are in Plymouth. Now, while the Mayflower was anchored in Plymouth Bay, the Pilgrims decided to write out the rules and regulations to govern their colony. And some historians have pointed to these rules and regulations as the first written constitution in North America. Rebecca, would you tell us about the Mayflower Compact and the rules and regulations the Pilgrims wanted for their colony? Well, one of their problems was they didn't really have a legal paper giving them permission to settle where they'd landed or to construct a government. So they really had to draw up the Mayflower Compact as a personal interim agreement. And it had to be agreed by everybody. And some of the people were quite different, although they were some quite rough people there who wouldn't obey the rules. And so it had to be sort of laws agreed amongst them. And this, in historical terms, was a revolution because there was no mention of the king. This was really contractual government sort of writ large. And that is, I think, very exciting for historians to see this written compact and all these people signing this compact. Because this is really the first time in Western European history that you have people setting their own rules, that it's not dictated from central government in England. It's a community deciding on their own sort of laws. And they brought some English laws with them. They had a phrase which nothing was going to be repugnant to English law. But that didn't mean that they couldn't then expand and have their own different kind of laws. But John Robinson had been very worried about the sort of difference between all the people on the ship. And he'd sent them letters to his flock saying that they've really got to sort of find a way of agreeing amongst themselves. And I think perhaps he sort of influenced the compact. And everyone accepted that Miles Standish should be their military leader. And they needed discipline. And, you know, some of the Billington family were very sort of they wouldn't really do what they were told. And in fact, John Carver was so annoyed that he hogtied John Billington because he was always sort of making trouble. I mean, what's interesting also is the Mayfair Compact shows that some of the more educated, including Brewster, Carver and Edward Winslow, had an understanding of social contract theory. And that's sort of tremendously exciting to see. And I think historians feel that there is a whiff of the Declaration of Independence in the compact. So even if it's sort of by accident, it is revolutionary. Earlier, we discussed how the Pilgrims had to spend their first New English winter living aboard the Mayflower. When did winter start to clear? When is it that the Pilgrims were able to get off the Mayflower and start building the homes and community that they would live in? They start building on December the 25th. And of course, Being Puritans or separatists, they were against holy days. So that was fine with them. And they start building what's called the common house, which was a 20 foot square structure. And even that was a huge effort as everyone was ill and they had to cut down trees. And they raised this gun platform and put their cannon on it because they sense there are Native Americans watching them, but they're just not quite sure where they are. They've got to be by the sea because they're going to need to import a lot of their goods from Europe and from England. And they have huge debts to the merchant adventurers in London. So they're going to have to pay them off. They thought with fish, they should be by the sea. In fact, fur, not fish, was going to be their financial salvation. But they decide they must build the town on high ground. So facing the sea and buy this land, which had already been cleared by a group of Indians, And there's also what they call a very sweet brook, which ran under the hillside. And what Bradford calls many delicate springs of as good water as can be drunk. And in the bay, there were places to shelter their shallop and the boats they were going to build in the future. And then on the tall hill, they were going to have a platform, which they were not only going to just have cannon on, but then they could command all the views and see into the bay and see Cape Cod. So they could sort of watch out. It was a sort of defensive position. And one of the real issues was they had to have lots of wood and there was lots of wood around and it had to be easy to carry because they were all so sick. So they start really building other houses in January because they need to get the sick off the ship because the sailors keep agitating. They want to return to England as soon as possible because they have no shelter. And they Lay out the gardens first, the grounds, and there's a beautiful 
drawing, really, a sort of document of what they called their meersteads, which was the Dutch word of all the people who came on the Mayflower who'd survived and where they were going to live. They lived side by side in a street with houses on either side for protective reasons. Your descriptions provide a really interesting look at the daily life for the pilgrims, or at least what I imagine their daily life to have looked like. Lots of trapping furs, farming food, chopping wood, perhaps building houses and outbuildings, going to church. It really just sounds like if you form the first settlement and there's not a lot around you to do, that life was fairly simple, arduous, and perhaps even boring at times. I think it was very exciting if you were a man, because Edward Winslow describes how the Native Americans, you know, after they've met up, they're traveling for 50 miles with them. They're going in canoes with them. They're discovering this beautiful land. And in fact, his description of the sort of first summer is rhapsodic. There's strawberries, there's wonderful fish, there's wonderful weather, the air is very clear. So once they've got their houses built and the sun started to shine, I think this is a very happy time at the beginning of the colony. So all told, how long did it take the pilgrims to build their first village at Plymouth? There are all sorts of descriptions. At first, people are sort of living together in common houses, and then they're sort of beginning to slowly build houses out. And in about 1627, which is the date that Plymouth Plantation, the Living Museum, has decided to have their village, that's every family has their own house. And that's because they basically, the merchants in London have washed their hands of them and are refusing to help. So they decide to pay them off and just have their own colony on their own and not have to live in a communal way. So everybody's going to have their own house and shares in the cattle. And so that if you go to Plymouth Plantation, you see it pretty well as what it was like in 1627, and that you have all these houses with thatch opposite one another. And there are lots of descriptions of this period. So it's coming together by 1624, but at the time it's sort of really everyone has their own house is about 1627. I'd like for us to turn our conversation now to the Pilgrims' interactions with Native American peoples. Because you mentioned earlier that the Pilgrims were on the lookout for Native Americans, and that they even came to North America with a smattering of Native American words. So after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, this is what I'd like us to discuss. The Pilgrim's journey was one that spanned continents and cultures. And as we can trace the Pilgrim's movement from England to Holland and then to North America, we can see how much they had to adapt and change in order to maintain their religious identities. And these adaptations would have included languages. The Pilgrims would have learned at least some Dutch while they lived in Leiden. And as Rebecca related, they also learned a smattering of Native American vocabulary before and after they moved to North America. Of course, it would have taken them a lot of reading and practice speaking to learn these languages. But thankfully, we can learn a language like Dutch a lot faster and a lot easier with Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world. Babbel makes it possible to learn Spanish, French, Italian, German, Russian, Swedish, and you guessed it, Dutch, plus many more. Babbel's lessons are designed to get you speaking confidently in your new language and actually remember what you learn. In fact, using Babbel, you could be speaking your new language within weeks. And now, as Ben Franklin's World listener, you can go to babbel.com and use offer code BFWORLD to get 50% off your first three months. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, and use offer code BFWORLD to save 50% off your first three months. Rebecca, how did the pilgrims get along with and interact with their new neighbors, the Native Americans, and how did local Native Americans get along with and interact with the pilgrims? Yes, I think that these were astonishingly good, actually, for much of the history of Plymouth. I think they were very excited about meeting Native Americans, and they were also extremely dependent on the Wampanoags. I mean, really, without their help, they wouldn't have known how to sow what was then called Indian corn, how to fertilize it. And they needed the friendship of the Wampanoags, and particularly Massasoit, to sort of be a sheltering arm so that the other American Indian tribes would leave them alone because they were just 50 people. They were really a tiny, tiny number. And once they realized that fish was not going to be really sort of the best thing to make money because there were a lot of fishing ships sort of circling 
not nearby, but sort of taking the fish. So they realized fur was what was going to make them money. And the fur they could only access via Massasoit. And his sort of kin were up at Hudson's Bay. And the best fur was in the north because that's where it grew thickest. So there were no maps. They had some maps from John Smith, but they had no idea how to get around the countryside. So the Wampanoag's friendship was everything to them. And it was very exciting to meet them because I think what we don't realize is they were sort of in vogue. Who were these Native American tribes? This was enormously interesting and exciting for intellectuals, for colonists, for promoters of colonies. And there was all this speculation. How do we fit these people into our Eurocentric Christian scheme of things? So had they survived Noah's flood, for example? There was a theory that they could be some of the lost tribes of Israel. And that was a very, very popular theory till about 1650. So that everyone was fascinated with Native Americans. And Edward Winslow had actually been in London when Pocahontas arrived on a state visit to James I. And she was the daughter of the Emperor Powhatan of Virginia. And she was treated to a proper state visit. There was a mask in her honor given by Ben Johnson. There was dancing. She sat on the right hand of James I. She was treated as she was as a royal personage. English playwrights wrote plays about her. I mean, she was really a very, very exciting personality. And I think the pilgrims were fascinated by Native Americans. There was also all this literature they'd read about, you know, Europe had become so corrupt. Perhaps there was going to be sort of purity in the new world. Perhaps there were going to be like sort of a better race of people. So there was lots of excitement about them. And the Native Americans turned out to be great fun. And they had lots of feasts together. And at the same time, the Wampanoags needed the friendship of the pilgrims because the terrible plague of smallpox, which sort of raged on that bit of the coast, had wiped out a huge number of Massasoit's people, but it left the Narragansetts, who lived at Rhode Island, untouched because it hadn't got that far. And so he needed help and he needed new technology and he thought they would be great allies, which is why he and his brothers had been sort of watching what was going on at Plymouth. And then they all become very friendly. And Massasoit is in a position of the Narragansetts now being his overlord, which is very humiliating. And so he thinks that the pilgrims are going to be much more powerful allies against the Narragansetts. So they become very friendly. And in fact, John Winthrop, who writes in his diary 14 years after Plymouth is founded about how he's got to know someone called Edward Winslow, whose great buddy is Massasoit, the king of the Wampanoags, and that Massasoit plays tricks on Edward Winslow. And they all note that the pilgrims are being sort of taken around the country by canoe with the Wampanoags and that they have a trading post just by Massasoit's house. So the wealth of Plymouth, because by about 1636, they are kings of the fur trade. And that's noted by Massachusetts again, is really to do with their very close, warm personal friendship with the Wampanoags. And of course, this is added to because Edward Winslow thinks he hasn't seen Massasoit for a bit and he goes to visit him. And I mean, he's also on his way. There's a ship being wrecked. And so, but anyway, he goes to visit Massasoit and he finds he's terribly ill. I mean, terribly ill. And they've heard that if someone's ill, the Native American way is to pretty well pay a state visit in case the person's going to die. So he goes and Massasoit is very ill and he's got a furred tongue and Edward has a sort of homemade cure, which he gets some soup. And whether this really kills him, whether this is chicken soup, Massasoit believes he has been cured by Edward. And so the friendship gets warmer and warmer. And I mean, the pilgrims go and stay in Native American houses. It's really a very warm friendship until Boston is founded. And also Edward writes about the Native Americans saying this is a very moral civilization and he's an early ethnographer. And there's a lot of engaging with one another in a very warm way. Native Americans live in Plymouth. Roger Williams, who of course goes on to found Rhode Island and has to escape from Massachusetts. One of the reasons that he is able to escape and find land in what becomes Providence is that he's met Native Americans 
in the meeting house at Plymouth where they have listened, you know, they're encouraged to listen to the preaching and he preaches so that he got to know them there. So then Massasoit and actually two Narragansett kings give him land. And that's about 1636. So people mingle with each other at the beginning. It sounds like both the pilgrims and the Wampanoags relied on each other to improve both of their societies. And of course, one of the great symbols, you know, that myth, legend and historical memory portrays of their friendship is the first Thanksgiving in 1621. So what's the story behind the first Thanksgiving? Great experts say it's really just a harvest. You know, the word Thanksgiving isn't used in that way, but they are giving thanks for a harvest. And it certainly is Native Americans gathering with the pilgrims. And they don't bring a turkey, but they eat together. And they have obviously encouraged the Native Americans to be part of it because, you know, it's a feast of all of them celebrating the land. And Edward Winslow describes how King Massasoit with some 90 men for three days We entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation. So maybe you should have deer instead of turkey. So that's just Edward Winslow describing one of the many feasts that goes on. And in fact, there's a description of Massasoit dancing at Governor William Bradford's second wedding. And there's a lot of friendship. Wow. That sounds like a great party. It lasted three days. There was dancing, an abundance of food, and a harvest, which raises the question. What did they really eat over three days? Well, they obviously ate deer. I think they would have eaten pies. I mean, it's very unclear when the first oven gets to Plymouth. Some people think there was something you would just put in the corner of your chimney. But it would have been a lot of game. There definitely was turkey, but it wasn't brought by the Native Americans. We've now covered a lot of the basics about the pilgrims and their settlement at Plymouth. But before we move into the time warp, One last question. Rebecca, what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about the Pilgrims and their settlement at Plymouth? And how do you think correcting this misconception might help us better understand early American history? I think that there is a great misunderstanding about the, obviously not everywhere, but about the warm friendship between the Native Americans and Plymouth. I think it was very warm. I mean, I think we've gone through phases sort of thinking, oh, no, it wasn't. But I think the documents show that the first 15 years, you can't argue against that these are people who visit one another, who eat together, who feast together. I think that unfortunately, in 1637, you get the Pequod War, and that really just changes the tone of the discourse. And actually, really, the arrival of people to create the Massachusetts colony sort of changes everything. And unfortunately, it has a slight knock-on effect on Plymouth in that they don't want to have a war against the Pequods, but the people at Boston who don't really understand Native American ways because they've only been there for sort of five years are being encouraged to think that the Native Americans sort of are satanic, whereas the people at Plymouth were much, much more open-minded. And then the war has a knock-on effect so that it creates a mood of hostility. And so the Native Americans begin to think that the Pequods were right to say, let's get rid of the English, otherwise they're going to get rid of us. And then it sort of all starts to degenerate. But I think that has colored too much the early years at Plymouth so that people think, oh, Thanksgiving's all a myth. It isn't a myth. It really took place and it reflected a warmth between the two people and mutual dependency. And now it's time for the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, how might the history of New England and North America have been different? if the Pilgrims had stayed in the province of Holland? The Pilgrims were really sort of canaries down the mine for Puritans, not just separatists in England. They could survive. They showed the English that you could go to America and live, that people they knew were all right. So by 1630, when things were really getting very difficult in England, 
Puritans were being persecuted, it meant they could sort of all get out. And that was 20,000 people who left England between 1630 and 1640. So I think that without the pilgrims, if they just stayed put, there might not have been Puritan New England or people would have been more nervous about leaving. And as American exceptionalism derives a good deal from the Puritans, John Winthrop's image of city on a hill, um, who knows, would John Winthrop have got there? So, you know, maybe everything would have been quite different without them. So what's next for you, Rebecca? What comes after Plymouth Colony and the Pilgrims? Another history or perhaps another biography? Well, I'm very interested in William Penn. That's a bit later, but still in America and England. And how can we get in contact with you if we have more questions about the Pilgrims, the Mayflower or Plymouth Colony? Well, I'm a member of BIO, the International Biographers Club, which has my details. Nets online and also the Amazon author website. And I tweet as our Fraser author. Rebecca Fraser, thank you so much for taking us through the story of the Pilgrims, their settlement at Plymouth and the very first Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. If we want to understand the Pilgrims, we need to understand something about European history. 17th century Europe was not a place where people could worship any religion they liked freely. It was a place of state-supported religion. In England, that meant the Anglican Church. In France and Spain, that meant the Catholic Church. In the Netherlands, it meant the Dutch Reformed Church. Although, as the Dutch were engaged in a war for independence from Catholic Spain, cities in the Dutch Republic often turned a blind eye to the practice of other forms of Protestantism. As Rebecca related, some cities, like Leiden, intended to celebrate all that was Protestant, because to do so was anti-Spanish and anti-Catholic. Now, in 1608, a group of Anglican dissenters from Yorkshire, England, known as the Scrooby Congregation, migrated to Leiden. The Scrooby dissenters, or separatists as the Anglican Church called them, believed the Church of England retained too many practices associated with Catholicism. These dissenters wanted to return to a simpler faith, a faith that recalled the practices of Christ's first church. And to achieve and return to this simpler faith, they believed that they needed to leave or separate from the Church of England and form a completely new congregation. But in early 17th century England, it was illegal to belong to any other church than the Church of England, which is why the Scrooby congregation migrated to Leiden. Now, life in Leiden proved hard for the Scrooby congregants. Although they were permitted to worship as they like, they were poor immigrants. A family of 7 to 10 might live in a single 10 foot by 13 foot room where they would eat, sleep, socialize, and pray. Or they might live in a small wooden hut in their minister John Robinson's garden. But as Rebecca noted, the ability to worship as they wished seemed to make up for the fact that they lived these hard lives. Now, within a decade of their migration, it became apparent that the Scrooby congregants, who we remember today as the pilgrims, couldn't stay in Leiden forever. The Dutch waged their war for independence from Spain between 1568 and 1648, which is why we remember it as the Eighty Years' War. Now, during this war, there was an event called the Twelve Years' Truce. Basically, the Dutch Republic and Spain agreed to take a 12-year break from their war between 1609 and 1621. As the end of this 12-year break in their war neared, the Dutch Republic's Protestant ally, James I of England, began to pressure the Dutch Republic to deport separatist groups like the Pilgrims, because they were publishing what he considered to be dangerous and heretical tracts that eventually found their way back to England. By mid-1619, Leiden was no longer a haven for Protestant dissenters. Plus, the Scrooby congregants were an English people living in a foreign land where their children were starting to pick up foreign manners and ideas. For all of these reasons, the dissenters looked for other places to settle. Now, one place the Scrooby congregants thought they might settle was in Virginia, which at the time, the English claim stretched from Jamestown to the Hudson River. England wanted colonists for Virginia, and the dissenters wanted a place to worship freely. So after negotiating with a group of investors, a group of Scrooby congregants purchased the small ship Speedwell and met a second group of colonists, which the investors organized, and prepared to sail aboard the Mayflower. Now, all told, there were 101 settlers who made their way to North America, and all of them sailed aboard the Mayflower. With these settlers came a very basic set of supplies. Clothing, bedding, axes, guns, armor, butter, alcohol, meal, goats, and a large iron jack to help them raise the new barns and houses they would build. Now, all of these supplies had to fit within the 80-foot to 20-foot cargo hold, or at least most of them, which left the passengers and their remaining supplies to cram into whatever other space was left aboard 
this 180-ton vessel. Now, due to a storm and makeshift repairs, the Mayflower arrived in Provincetown on November 11, 1620. But they couldn't just settle there. Provincetown lacked a good water supply, good soil, and pretty much left the colonists in a very exposed position. This is why the Pilgrims eventually decided to settle in the more protected position at Plymouth. Using the hilled and cleared area of the former Wampanoag village of Patuxet, the Pilgrims set to work building their new homes and planting their new fields. Of course, this proved extremely hard and arduous to do, as winter had set in and frozen the ground, and an epidemic took hold over most of those migrants. Still, about half the colonists survived and prevailed over that epidemic. They prevailed in part thanks to the help of their Wampanoag neighbors, who showed them how to plant corn, access the fur trade, and generally how to survive in North America. As a result of this Native American assistance, the Pilgrims saw their first harvest come in during the fall of 1621, and to celebrate, Pilgrims and Wampanoags came together in a three-day party and feast we've come to know as the first Thanksgiving. But the Thanksgiving Day that we Americans know and celebrate today didn't begin in 1621. It began in 1863. The Thanksgiving that we Americans know and celebrate today began because Sarah Josepha Hale, an influential editor, wrote to President Abraham Lincoln and beseeched him to establish a national Thanksgiving Day to unify the American people through prayer during the Civil War. Lincoln agreed that it would be a great idea, and he invited his fellow Americans to celebrate and pray with him on the last Thursday of November. Now, Thanksgiving Day traditions have changed over time, including its day of celebration. In 1939, President Franklin Roosevelt moved Thanksgiving to the second to last Thursday in November, in the hope that it would give merchants an extra week of holiday sales during the Great Depression. So, did the Pilgrims bequeath us our American Thanksgiving? Sort of. They came together with their Wampanoag neighbors to celebrate their harvest and survival. In some ways, that spirit of coming together with friends, family, and neighbors still survives. But all the other traditions of that day came along in the late 19th and 20th centuries. You'll find more information about Rebecca, her book, The Mayflower, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 213. Don't forget, we're meeting up in Seattle at 3 p.m. on Saturday, December 1st at the Alaskan Sourdough Restaurant and Bakery on Alaskan Way. You'll find all the details for this event in the show notes. Now, whether you're planning to migrate to a foreign country like the Pilgrims, or you just want to have some fun and learn another language, Babbel has you covered. Babbel is the number one language learning app in the world. And right now, when you visit babbel.com and use offer code BFWORLD, you can save 50% off your first three months. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L.com, and use offer code BFWORLD to save 50% off your first three months. My Omohundro Institute Digital Projects team teammate, Holly White, provided production assistance for this episode. Thanks, Holly and happy Thanksgiving. Finally, I hope you enjoy a wonderful Thanksgiving. Whether you celebrate American Thanksgiving this week or another Thanksgiving or Harvest Day tradition someplace else. And if you find time in between your celebration, please let me know how you celebrate. I'd love to know who you gather with and the types of food you eat. So let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.